run down the street, crash things. It's still fun to do. When I hear the name Bruce Willis, I guess I think of the tank top first. I immediately think of, honestly, probably the greatest action hero that we have. He has such a presence. He just seems to always be able to solve these situations. I always think of him in his iconic role in Die Hard. Well, I like this part. You know, I like the character. I like the sense of humor. He has such a presence. It seemed that he was having problems uh, with memory and with speech. Bruce. Oh, you know, struggling to remember lines, having to be fed the lines through an earpiece. There was an incident where a prop gun was fired on the wrong cue. I don't know if it's important. I don't think about it in those terms. I just still get a big kick out of it. I have a fun job. But it became clear that he just wasn't able to do the job anymore. I was a fan uh, of Bruce when I was 15. Well, I mean, die hard, doesn't he? He never dies, so, you know, he's always, his films always got lots of action in it, and I'm an action person. Because when I met him, I was like, whoa, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get why this guy's got the heat. Please help me welcome today's man of the hour, ladies and gentlemen, a guy who gives of his time, his talent, and most importantly, great performances every time out. Please welcome to the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Bruce Willis. It's always about you guys. It's always about the, you know, the folks who come out and, and see these films. And I and, uh, want to thank you all and take, take you know, whatever opportunity that I can to say thank you guys. Uh, um, there are a lot of people here who got me here. Films are part of the culture. I mean, watching TV and watching films uh, is all part of the culture. I still watch films and I still, I still go to the movies. I'm a big fan of films and, it's, and sometimes things catch on. He's so cool and he's so strong and so fit and, and tall. And I see him, you know, in a white vest, covered in blood, and getting himself and other people out of impossible situations, armed with like a bit of rope and a pen and a gun. yippee ki yay motherfucker. yippee ki yay motherfucker. It's my little girl that I'd be coming home. So Die Hard and John McClane, and immediately, like, that is always the role that he's going to be associated with. But then my mind goes, wait a minute. Bruce Willis, was, he's so much more than that. He's Moonrise Kingdom, you know, he's the Sixth Sense. He has all these different, he's moonlighting. He has all these different shades to him. So I, I guess like my overall image of Bruce Willis is an expectation and then that expectation undermined. I think Bruce Willis is a really great actor. I think what is great about Bruce Willis is he does have this persona of being this incredible action hero, but also has done lots of family movies as well, like Look Who's Talking and Look Who's Talking Too, which are actually, Look Who's Talking is one of my favorite films of all time. So versatile um, and so well loved. You know, I think when people talk about Bruce Willis working with him, people have nice things to say about him. Just that charismatic, like even if he wasn't a movie star and he walked into a room, would it be like, you guys, look at this guy who just walked in. He's got something very powerful happening. What do you think Bruce makes Bruce Willis so cool? Um, his great sense of humor, which I think is probably the, you know, the sexiest element that anybody can have. Thanks, have I feel like I always catch myself underestimating him, which I feel bad for because I, I do find myself drifting so much to, oh my god, yeah, he was just John McClane from Die Hard. He's the guy who uh, said, ho, 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 now I have a machine gun. Um, but I, I really, I actually really love all the, the smaller roles he did, the more offbeat stuff, like 12 Monkeys is such a, a great performance from him. So I, 
I have a very high opinion of Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis was born to a German mother uh, and an American father. Uh, his father was in the military and he was stationed in West Germany and that's where Bruce Willis was born in 1955. He was one of four children. And I think his childhood was always really characterised by this like blue collar working class life. So when his father was discharged from the military, uh, he was a factory worker, he was also a mechanic, whilst his mother worked in a bank. So he described himself as having a blue collar upbringing. And that's really the image that he carried with him throughout his entire career and in film forms so much of the work that he did. So when Bruce Willis was at school, he had a stutter and the kids at school used to call him Buck Buck. Um, and actually he joined an acting club and he found that when he was acting, that helped him get rid of the stutter. And he ended up studying that at university and actually that's, I guess, his stutter kicked off his acting career. Bruce Willis attended Montclair University and he starred in plays like Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And he moved to New York City. He wanted to pursue his acting dreams and he ended up working as a private investigator for a while. But then he did make his Broadway debut in 1977. So Bruce Willis's first major acting role in New York was actually in the show Moonlighting, which he starred in from 1985 uh, for four years. And when he moved to New York, he was working as a private investigator. And then in the show Moonlighting, he actually played a private investigator. So he could take lots of his real life experience and apply that to the role. And that was a very successful role. So uh, when they when they came to create Moonlighting, at first it was really clear that they wanted to cast Sybil Shepherd, who was already like a fairly big star because of Taxi Driver. And then there was this secondary character that evolved out of it, the romantic co-lead. And 3,000 actors auditioned, and there was this real sense of like, no guy can do this because he had to be like suave, he had to be like a little misogynistic, but he had to be really charming and also incredibly intelligent, but kind of come across a little bit of a doofus. And there was this idea immediately that, yeah, let's not bother. Like they actually tried to pay the creator and Sybil Shepherd to just like trash the idea <laughs> and start again. And then Bruce Willis came along and he managed to capture everything perfectly. And there was one female studio executive who, I don't know how much this influenced the decision to hire him, said, he looks like one dangerous fuck. And that's how Bruce Willis ended up in Moonlighting. Bruce Willis's turn in Moonlighting was so successful that it definitely opened him up to Hollywood and opened him up to producers. And so he was cast opposite Kim Basinger in Blind Date in 1987, which was his first feature film role. And then he went on to play a cowboy in Sunset in 1989. At that time, I think we kind of take this for granted now because of the streaming era, every single celebrity is doing a movie and then a TV show and back and forth and nobody cares. But in that era, like this idea of transitioning from TV to film was a real risk. For every Tom Hanks, there was like a Ted Danson or a David Caruso. So at first, you know, Bruce Willis, he did a couple of Blake Edwards films, one with Frank Sinatra and one with Paul Newman. But like the real shift, of course, happened with Die Hard. It was a similar situation that happened with Moonlighting. It was sort of a repeat of that scenario where at first 
Nobody wanted to do Die Hard. It was originally meant to be a sequel to a Frank Sinatra film, who was 70 at the time, and managed to wriggle his way out of that one. And then every action guy in Hollywood turned it down. Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, reportedly Harrison Ford, like everybody. And again, it came to a point of, gosh, we don't, we don't know who to cast as this guy because the idea of Die Hard, the studio knew was a good sell. I think somebody described it as Rambo in an office building. So they were desperate to find just like any guy, any guy to fill in this position. And then there was Bruce Willis again, and he ended up being paid five million for it just because <laughs> they were so happy to find a guy who, who would do the role. Although there wasn't a lot of confidence in him at first. It's kind of interesting the first posters for Die Hard didn't even have his face on it. It was just the building. And then the movie comes out. He's so charming and so likable and so well cast in that role that, oh, magically, then his face is on all the posters and he becomes the movie star, the Bruce Willis that we know today. Hey, pal, how you feeling? The whole thing's being equal. I'd rather be in Philadelphia. I want you to have it. Only John can drive somebody that crazy. <laughs> He's an easy guy to like. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. And a hard man to kill. Bruce Willis, Die Hard. Got invited to the Christmas party by mistake. Who knew? There's the whole debate about whether Die Hard is a Christmas film or not. It's not a Christmas movie, it's a Bruce Willis movie. This is the best action movies ever made. I mean, if you're gonna be in an action movie, it better be Die Hard. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Bruce Willis was absolutely iconic in Die Hard, playing the part of John McClane. And I think what made John McClane so lovable is that Bruce Willis brought a real human element and actually real humor to the role of this kind of um, downtrodden police officer, he's going through marriage difficulties, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so Die Hard grossed a million dollars at box office when it came out in the 80s, and it's absolutely one of those iconic films. But John McClane is such a well-loved character, so much so they actually made five Die Hard movies all the way up until 2013. We see Bruce Willis in such a range of ridiculous situations. You know, Bruce Willis is saving a plane, or Bruce Willis is evacuating a building, or Bruce Willis is trying to save the world from cybercrime, or Bruce Willis is helping his long-lost son, you know, fight from all these criminals. Always wearing that white vest, whether it's under a shirt or not, and, and always getting himself and other people out of these ridiculous, impossible situations, single-handed, completely un unbelievable. But because it's John McClane, because it's Die Hard, because it's Bruce Willis, it is particularly believable. One thing that I think made Die Hard so realistic is Bruce Willis actually performs pretty much all of his own stunts. So when you do see him, you know, running along rooftops and jumping off planes and jumping out of cars, it's him doing it himself. And I think that actually makes it even more impressive that he's acting, he's playing this part, and he's doing his own stunts. And not a lot of action heroes do that, probably himself, Tom Cruise, but most of the others, they do have stunt doubles. This is real stunts, isn't it? You know what, Die Hard has always been, all, all four of these films have always been just big roller coaster rides, really. Just big hour and a half roller coaster rides that you go on and you know nobody's really getting hurt. And you know, if you go to watch it, you're not gonna get hurt and no, you know, and it's just fun. It's just fun to go, oh my God. Hey, you got hurt a little bit. He was really getting hurt. It looks pain. like he was getting hurt to me. We, we we put him through a lot. We really did. I mean, it was it was a uh, it was a pretty aggressive shoot, and the the, the stunts. Are, and I went to Bruce early on. And I said, look, I you know people know now, and they can they can see when it's a when it's a stunt man. They they pause things, and so the, the you know it's a little trick. You can actually see the stitches in two of the shots for you TiVo fans at home. But you know what? It's not that big a deal, really. I I can't remember any of it. I can't remember. You're anything. a you're a hard man. 
So you had the first three in quite quick succession. You had Die Hard, Die Hard 2, and Die Hard with a Vengeance. And then you had Live Free or Die Hard, and then A Good Day to Die Hard as well. And actually, as the years went on, they encompassed different storylines. Bruce Willis said at the time, you know, that he'd been playing the character for 25 years and that he loved to revisit the character and every time he made these films he always wanted to get better at it. So yeah, 25 year span, but they all remained so iconic and I don't think you could have ever cast anybody else in that role. I mean, when Die Hard was coming out, it had a bit of a buzz about it because Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone had turned down the part of John McClane. Bruce Willis was in that role and I think now you couldn't see anybody else playing John McClane. And I know in other films, like the Bourne film, you know, they replaced Matt Damon at one point and it was a bit iffy. You could never have done that with John McClane. You could never have Bruce Willis um, or, or you could never have anybody else in that role. It could never be anybody but Bruce Willis. And you know, he really lived up to the part of John McClane for those five films. I love Die Hard. I also love Die Hard for the Vengeance with Samuel L. Jackson. I think Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson together was a great pairing. They hated each other at the beginning, middle, and end of the film, and I just thought it was brilliant. I'm not jumping through hoops for some psycho. That's a white man with white problems. You deal with it. Where the hell are you going, McClane? I know what I'm doing. What you're doing. This guy wants to pound on you till you crumble. Are you aiming for these people? No. Well, maybe that mine. He wants you to dance to his tune and then kill you. Oh, dear. You don't like me because I'm white. I don't like you because you're going to get me killed. People have opinions on the Die Hard sequels. I think Die Hard's great, and they maybe should have left it at that because... The issue with the sequels, and there is a mixed quality to them, is that they just kept increasingly losing sight of what made John McClane so great, which was that really human quality, that guy who just wants to get back home to his wife that he realized he hasn't really ever treated the way that she deserves. Like By the fourth one, he was, he was just like all the macho guys that John McClane was meant to subvert. So it's sort of disappointing. After the first Die Hard movie, again, this opened up Bruce Willis to a whole load of roles. So he started in Country, where he played a veteran, and then opened up to the family market, really, with Look Who's Talking and Look Who's Talking 2, with Kirstie Alley, where he, uh, he, you know, there's the kind of, there's the voiceover of the baby, a really unique concept at the time. Uh, and like I said, opened Bruce Willis up to a whole market. So, you know, he'd done Broadway, he'd done TV and Moonlighting, he'd done Die Hard, so he'd nailed the action hero corner. And now to hear him doing a family movie meant that, you know, Bruce Willis was an all-rounder and probably that's what led him to being, you know, at one point the eighth highest paid actor of all time. He cornered all areas of the market. So post Die Hard, the first one, that gave him a huge boost. He was really kind of an overnight sensation, which happens a lot less than I think we think it does. And I've always thought that has to do a lot with how he played John McClane because we were in the era of these like almost godlike macho tough guys, the Sylvester Stallones, the Arnold Schwarzeneggers. And, you know, Bruce Willis was tough, but he also, he brought that, like, working blue collar upbringing with him into that role. And he's smart, but he's panicky, and he is really a guy who thinks he's gonna die, so he's doing the best that he can, and I think every single person in the audience can relate to that. You know, and he was the action hero that when he walked on glass, his feet bled. And that was strangely a kind of a new thing for audiences at the time. Well, that you know, that's our jobs as as actors is to be different every time and to and to always try to you know be entertaining and not look like you did in the last film. Thank you all 
So what's so interesting about Bruce Willis's career is that he easily just could have been John McClane for the rest of his acting career and it would have been fine and he would have been beloved. But there's there's a real sense in his choices that he was trying to push at the edges and see, you know, what more can Bruce Willis mean? What more can Bruce Willis do? And that's why I love that he decided to do Death Becomes Her which is a comedy that was not so well received at the time but is now kind of a queer like camp classic and obviously it's all about Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn in that movie but uh the role that Bruce Willis plays is this like bespectacled plastic surgeon who's kind of like the beta male of the situation now he's dead he's dead Ernest is dead everybody's dead <laughs> You pushed me down the stairs. I'm so sweaty. I don't think it's sweat, honey. I think you're defrosting. I, I love it because it, it's just such an active, conscious contrast to John McClane, and it's a real, like, I will not be defined by this one thing. In the same way that Die Hard was him going, I will not be defined by moonlighting. Bruce Willis starred in Pulp Fiction in 1994, and Pulp Fiction is absolutely iconic. It's iconic in its styling, uh, in the use of the actors, and there's so many things about Pulp Fiction that make it so iconic. It has like this cult-like status. It's the way, you know, they use continuity and the way they went back and forth with the storyline. It's the actors, it's what they wore. You know, it's one of the most quotable films of all time. You know, you've got that, the scene with everybody be cool, it's a robbery, or the whole, you know, what do they call a quarter pounder with cheese in Paris? And you know what they call a quarter pounder with cheese in Paris? What do they call it? Royale with cheese. Royale with cheese. You know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and Bruce Willis, you know, fitted in again with Samuel L. Jackson and all the other great actors in Pulp Fiction uh, and is really part of its cult-like status. The thing with Pulp Fiction is that it, it's always been remembered as the John Travolta, like, rehabilitation project. And then, you know, he got the Oscar nomination. It was also all about Uma Thurman. I think we kind of tend to forget Bruce Willis's part in that movie, but... Like, he's so fantastic. In Pulp Fiction, Bruce Willis played an aging boxer who was on the run. Box in a car, minus a head in a garage. Take me to it. Mother... Who's Sid? Sid's dead, baby. Get it. Sid's dead. I love you, pumpkin. I love you, honey bunny. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! <laughs> What's Fonzie like? Cool. Correct the mundo. And that's what we're gonna be. We're gonna be cool. It's kind of encompassing everything that's so great about him as an actor. Quentin Tarantino always said that Bruce Willis had the air of a 1950s film star that nobody else had. And he looked like a 50s actor. He looked like a Robert Mitchum type. And, and that's why he was cast in it. And so you have this boxer who's too proud to to throw a fight who's you know tough and silent and mean but also has this these real moments of tenderness with uh his girlfriend fabienne uh and i just i love the the contrast between i love how he goes in between those two extremes and his storyline like maybe isn't the most memorable when you look back on Pulp Fiction, but I think it's always the most surprising when you're watching it. It was kind of um, a sort of low budget indie film. It had Quentin Tarantino at the helm, but what it did was cement Bruce Willis's career in this cult-like status, in this film, uh, playing this boxer on a run, and inevitably did so well at box office, earned millions of dollars. Quentin Tarantino really just like created his own cinematic language and that became the cinematic language of 90s independent cinema and has influenced so much going on from that. And I, I think 
every actor that's been sort of like touched by the hand of Tarantino, like that becomes part of that iconography. And even for Bruce Willis, if that's, it might not be the part that he's most remembered for, but there is this extra streak of cool to him because he was in a Tarantino movie. In 1987, Bruce Willis married Demi Moore, and they were certainly um, a Hollywood golden couple, absolutely. And they had three daughters, they had Ruma, uh, Scott LaRue and Tallulah. Uh, and, you know, they were quite active in Hollywood in their own right as well. But Bruce Willis and Demi Moore got divorced in 2000, but have remained incredibly close, actually. And when Demi Moore got remarried to asking, Aston Kutcher, it was Bruce Willis that walked her down the aisle. Uh, meanwhile, Bruce Willis himself was remarried to Emma Hemming. They got married in Turks and Caicos, and they have two young daughters as well. Right. Do you find it difficult sometimes with uh, having two celebrity parents, especially with your kids? Uh, you're both working always off on different sides of the country? It's not difficult. I mean, it's no more difficult than any other problem that anybody has who's married and has to work and can't always be with their kids. It's, you know, it's just part of that thing. That's all. You've got to work and got to take care of your kids, and sometimes it's hard to figure out, and sometimes it's a breeze. Pleasure talking to you. I love the first two movies. Thank you. And, um, You'll, like this this one. You'll like Thank the first you, two. You'll like this one. Thank you. All right, Eric. Peace. Are you a science fiction fan? Uh, well, I'm a Bruce Willis fan, so I'm just going to go in there and... I mean, all, most of those films have been good, so I'm hoping this one's going to be one of those. What do you like about Bruce Willis? Well, he die hard, doesn't he? He never dies, so, you know, he's always... His films always got lots of action in it, and I'm an action person. Thank you very much. So post Pulp Fiction, Bruce Willis starred in The Fifth Element with Mia Djokovic playing a taxi driver that has to help save the earth. It had this kind of um, sci-fi um, theme, if you will. I mean, Fifth Element, again, was, was kind of an unexpected turn from Bruce Willis because it's such a, it's such an out there movie. I mean, there's alien opera singers and those Jean-Paul Gaultier costumes that are insane and beautiful and sexy. Oh, And what was unique about this film is it was actually filmed in Paris and until 2011 it was the highest grossing European film of all time and it really put European filmmaking on the map you know before in the 90s and 80s you know everything was filmed in Hollywood filmed in the US but this was a completely different feel actually with European actors as well. I think having Bruce Willis at the center of it all he's kind of like the grounding point where there is all the insanity and then there's just the guy in the center who's trying to get through it and for that he was the perfect choice this is really exciting for me it, it really is it's it's uh uh the most exciting thing is to see all you guys come out here and 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 uh and anytime you can hold up traffic on hollywood boulevard it's always a big deal. Well, it's a big occasion. Uh, I get to see all. I get to see a lot of my friends that I don't get to see. Uh, and I want to thank them for coming out. I want to thank my family for coming out. Thank you all so very much for letting me go off and do all these movies and 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 uh, welcoming uh, welcoming me when I when I come back. My mom is here, as uh, Johnny Grant said. Good job, mom. I used to come down here and, and, uh, and look at these stars, and, and I, I could never quite figure out what, what you were supposed to do to, uh, to get one. So there was a Bruce Willis project called Broadway Baller that completely f fell apart. It was a really, like, very tense set, a lot of creative head sputting. And um, instead of... Disney suing Bruce Willis for the project failing, they cut him a deal and said, do your three next projects with us, 
for a little bit of a, a smaller fee and you'll be in the clear. And the first of those projects, uh, he accepted three million for it. Usually he'd be asking for around 10 million, was Armageddon. They've made a few requests though, such as Oscar here has got some outstanding parking tickets. Uh, Max would like you to bring back eight track tapes. Not sure if that's gonna work. Yeah, one more thing, um, none of them wanna pay taxes again. Armageddon is one of those classic disaster movies. I mean, it has the big soundtrack, it has the, the world's gonna end if we don't uh, save the world from a massive asteroid, which is exactly what happened in Armageddon. So Bruce Willis teams up with this gang of misfits, as you were, who join NASA and basically are fired up into space to stop an asteroid hitting Earth. Tell me you've never let anybody down before. I never quit yet. How's that? Earth's darkest day. How you feeling? Good. Considering I've never been this scared in my entire life. Will be man's finest hour. I'm marrying you. You bet you are. <laughs> Now, I think, actually, if Bruce Willis had been John McClane in Armageddon, he could have solved this just by himself in a white vest because we know he's capable of doing that right because he's so incredible. But this was just such a brilliant film. Liv Tyler was in it as well. Lots of great actors in it. And it is just that classic disaster movie and the big Aerosmith song and everything. Just an absolute classic disaster film. And... It's, a, it's again one of those films where he became the, the grounding point and this like this streak of sincerity in what is a sort of mildly preposterous space movie about deep sea oil drillers going onto asteroids and blowing them up. And what always strikes me about Armageddon is that you spend the entire movie going, this is so silly, this is so dumb, and this is so unbelievable. And yet, by the end, when Bruce Willis has his real hero moment, you're crying and you're kind of mad at yourself for crying because you're going, this is, they're, they're gonna blow up an asteroid, this is so dumb. And yet, there's just this, this human emotion that still comes out of it somehow and it feels like a miracle and it's all because Bruce Willis is there. In 1999, Bruce Willis teamed up with M. Night Shyamalan uh, for the first of his films that he starred in, and that was The Sixth Sense. Now, that told um, a story of a young boy who's having psychological problems, and Bruce Willis plays his therapist. Now, M. Night Shyamalan is notable for supernatural films that always have an incredible twist at the end, and The Sixth Sense certainly provided that. It's one of those films that you watch it and then you immediately have have to watch it again. Again, a different direction for Bruce Willis, but really, really play the character of the therapist so well. You know, and with the young boy, the two of them on screen were absolutely incredible. Tony Collette was in that film as well, and they garnered quite a few Academy nominations for that film because it did so well. Uh, and then Bruce Willis worked again with M. Night Shyamalan on Unbreakable. Again, another psychological thriller, again with a great twist at the ending. And yeah, I, it was brilliant to see Bruce Willis in these kind of roles like completely different from being in Friends and completely different from The Fifth Element and completely different from John McClane and again completely different from Luke Who's Talking too. This film really, these two films actually really showed his versatility and M. Night Shyamalan has a habit of doing that, that he will work with an actor on two or three films in succession and, and really mold them and, and and bring out the best in them in that way and like he is the king of the big twist at the end i think that they know that you're one of these very rare people who can see them so you need to help them what if they don't want to help i don't think that's the way it works how do you know for sure is anyone there Sixth Sense and Unbreakable are in such good examples of Bruce Willis like acknowledging and understanding his like star identity as as this giant action hero and going, 
oh, let me use that kind of against the audience in a, in a loving way. Because the great thing about The Sixth Sense is that the hero is Bruce Willis and you immediately want to trust him and root for him and you have a certain amount of faith in him. And to come out at the other end of the movie going, oh my God, like, he was the vulnerable one this entire time. Like, he was the thing that was doing the haunting. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's okay to spoil the sex heads. It's been long enough. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, he's, he's the ghost. He's the terror in the room, which I, I think if it had been anybody other than Bruce Willis, it wouldn't have been that same level of surprise. <laughs> You are the man. You are the man. <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> Still sexy. I'm just a love machine. I'm just a love machine. <laughs> but you have baby bear. Bruce Willis was in a couple of episodes of Friends, actually, where he played the father of Ross Geller's much younger girlfriend, but also ended up dating Rachel, who was played by Jennifer Aniston at the time. Um, he was so popular, actually, in Friends, they ended up winning a couple of awards, and he was only in, I think, two or three episodes. And when they filmed it, you know, every time Bruce Willis, like, walked into Central Park or walked on stage, the cheering from the audience every time we walked on set the crowd would go mad and cheering for him for ages so yeah it was i it would not a part i would have seen him in but he has great comedic timing and friends was so iconic at that time as was bruce willis so it was a great a great meeting of minds and a great coming together there i mean he was only in it for a couple of episodes but he was really really funny and worked well with all the characters as well Hey everyone, I'm Alison Buck, and tonight we're at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood for the premiere of one of this summer's most highly anticipated action films, The Expendables. Give this job to my friend here. He loves playing in the jungle. Right? Right. It's his problem. Bruce Willis, Sylvester Stallone, and Arnold Schwarzenegger had never appeared on screen together before The Expendables in 2010. Now, initially the film was Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger playing in this action hero film, and Bruce Willis only had a small part, and the three of them um, appeared together in this scene in a church, which they filmed in one day. But when The Expendables came back for the next film, for the sequel, he had a bigger role. I only worked with two guys the governor and the director. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I grew up watching Sly movies, so I'm a huge Sly fan. And for him to, uh, to give me a call and offer me the part in the movie, and uh, I accepted on the spot. Uh, and to fight with a guy for two days, that was a lot of fun. And you know, when you throw into the mix, I've got a fight scene with Randy Couture. And when you get a chance to fight with one of the greatest fighters walking the face of the earth right now and live to tell about it, and, and I still have all my teeth, that's pretty cool. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I sit down and, and talk with Mickey Rourke for 45 minutes an hour and, and, and ask him acting questions. So it was a blast. It's got the best cast, of course, of any film in the last 30 years. Uh, it's got the biggest action scenes, the biggest explosions, you know, no wire, nothing is fake. There are no wires, there are definitely no green screen, none of that BS where people fly between building to building. It's all like real fights, real hits, guys getting hurt. It's like a real guys movie, you know, that's what it is. So during this period when he starred in The Expendables, he also starred in Red, he starred in Looper, and he also made A Good Day to Die Hard. So definitely Bruce Willis was getting back into his action hero era. You know, after Die Hard, it's not like Bruce Willis fell off at all. He was keeping busy throughout the early 2000s and taking up, you know, a lot of roles. He's played in about over 100 films today. I think the one movie that has always kind of secretly been my favorite Bruce Willis project because it's the one that feels the most out of place in his filmography is Wes Anderson's Moonrise Kingdom because it's the only one he ever did with a director who, you know, tends to pick the same people over and over again and he's not really the the center of the movie. He's not 
um, he's, he's almost, his character's almost built to kind of live on the sidelines, this very, like, burdened dad who adopts this kid and, and is so struggling to love him, even though he does love him, but because he's in a Wes Anderson movie, he can't express those emotions in the way that he wants to. And there's just like this beautiful sadness to the performance and to the way that his shoulders are slumped and his, his looks as he's kind of clomping around this very immaculate house that to me, it's, it's really unexpected from him, but at the same time, I can feel like the entire history of his his action roles and all of this gun toting and all of these outsized heroics kind of being worn like like a ratty little torn up cape on his shoulders. Like there's something beautiful and sad about it, and I just love that performance. And. Uh... Time has passed, and now here I am doing this, and I'm still excited about it. I'm still excited to be an actor. I'm still uh, 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 thrilled to be asked back and uh, come out here and uh, uh, smile. Uh, everybody's going to talk about uh, all the movies and great roles that Bruce has done today, and I could list so many. Uh, I've done three with him, uh, Armageddon, Bandits, and uh, one yet to be released. Every time it's been an amazing experience. But uh, one thing I want to tell you about, besides being a great actor and a guy who is not afraid to appear in independent films or blockbusters or whatever, uh, one story i tell you real quickly about what he is as a person. Uh, right after the man who wasn't there, I got really sick and went in the hospital. And they didn't know how long I was going to be there. Well, the studio decided that uh, for Bandits, which I was supposed to do in a couple of weeks, they were just going to recast the role. And uh, Bruce went to him and said, this is the guy I'm starring in this movie with, period. And they said, well, how long do we wait? And he said, however long it takes. So that's the kind of person he is. And I'll never forget him for that. So not only does he deserve a star on this Walk of Fame as an actor, but also as a human being. So uh, to my buddy, Bruce Willis. I don't think about it very much. I don't, it seldom crosses my mind to think about retiring. And I'm sure at some point, I'll either be retired uh, by my own choice or not by my choice. Um, I still like working. I still like doing what I do. And I like the, the process of making films. You know, reports have come now, and directors that have worked with them have talked about, you know, experiences of him you know, struggling to remember lines, having to be fed the lines through an earpiece. There was an incident where a prop gun was fired on the wrong cue, which is obviously really concerning for, for on-set safety. Um, and, and just a, a general sense that he was struggling to do the job that he loved, which is heartbreaking for, for everyone. And you know, he was continuing to make all of these really low budget action movies, a lot of them, you know, straight to streaming, straight to video on demand, where he'd often just have minutes of screen time, enough to just put him on the poster and say, this is a Bruce Willis film, and it helped. It actually helped sell a lot of these really, really small independent films that would have struggled otherwise, but it became clear that he just wasn't able to do the job anymore. And so his family released a statement that he was retiring from acting after uh, a diagnosis of aphasia, which is a neurological condition that can really affect language and the ability to understand and follow instructions. And basically, you know, all the, the tools that an actor requires. 
in recent years, Bruce Willis has suffered from declining health. On the set of The White Elephant, uh, it seemed that he was forgetting lines and had to have his lines fed through an earpiece. He seemed confused on set, wondering why he was there. There was another film that he was working on where his filming days were reduced to just one day. Uh, his lines were cut down and he had to get everything done in a day. And on another set, he accidentally fired a firearm. Luckily, there was blanks in the gun and no one was hurt, but it seemed that he was having problems uh, with memory and with speech. And he was diagnosed with aphasia, which affects speech, which affects memory. Communication is a huge part of that, of that illness. And then more recently, we have found out that Bruce Willis is suffering from a form of dementia. And of course, that greatly affects your communication, affects your speech, affects memory and things like that. So Bruce Willis effectively has retired from acting. But we have seen um, his family really gathering around him, really supporting him and talking about his diagnosis, requesting space and thanking people for their support during this time. It must be difficult for Bruce Willis to have had to retire in this way, to be working on sets, to be forgetting why he's there, to be having problems on set. I think you would much rather decide for yourself that now is my time to go and go out on a high. But I think also it's a blessing that luckily he didn't get hurt or didn't hurt anyone else when he was having this, these issues. It must just be heartbreaking for him and I, I just can't imagine what it's like to to have this thing you love so much, just to not be able to, physically not be able to do it anymore. But he is still such an icon. You know, over a hundred films in the can. He was working on about 11 projects actually in, in the past couple of years uh, when he started having these health problems, which is a real shame. But he's such an iconic actor, such an iconic character in John McClane and others that that's what he will be remembered for. I think the one, like, I guess positive or really hopeful thing that's come out of this diagnosis is seeing just the public's reaction to it. It was such an outpouring of support and it was such a feeling of unity between his fans and him and his family. And there's just a sense of like, whatever happens next, everyone's got his back and everyone's there to support. And I, I feel like in terms of just how we have these conversations about aphasia and other neurological conditions, it's kind of really good to have it out in the public like that and in conversation and, and seeing that, you know, joy can still come out of this very difficult time for somebody. I think it's incredibly important that someone like Bruce Willis, who's suffering from this particular type of dementia, is bringing awareness to this condition because there will be thousands of people, probably millions of people out there who have it and millions of families who are going through that with them. And I think it's really incredible that he's shining a spotlight on this particular type of dementia, talking about it, talking about his diagnosis and how it affected his life, but also talking about the effect of the families and how families families uh, can help their relatives that are going through that. I think the, the really great thing that Bruce Willis gave uh, the action genre in general is just the idea of challenging itself because he, he came in at a time of like, be as macho as possible and said, hey, what if I was just some guy and uh, some guy just trying to survive? And that sort of very simple, like, purity about John McClane. You know, I, I think if you, you look at so many of the action heroes that we have today, I don't know if we'd have, like, John Wick falling down an infinite number of Parisian stairs if it weren't for John McClane, the everyman hero. He, he sort of broke open the box and now it feels like any sort of guy or girl or person <laughs> can lead an action movie. But I think looking at the choices that he's made, you know, the variety of films that, that he's gone after, the risks that he's taken, um, 
the things that he's tried and, and even when he's failed, it's sort of cool that he tried them. To me, that all points to a guy who just really loves the craft of acting and being on a set and creating characters. I can't imagine what it's been like for him. I mean, he's had such an incredible career that his legacy is secured. I mean, he will be loved and remembered forever for the work that he did. He's a great guy. He's a great man. He's, uh, he's a giver. You know, when you have a giver next to you uh, from the morning to night, he spends so much time together. So I was a fan uh, of Bruce when I was 15. Die Hard, Moonlighting. You know, just meeting him, he has such an iconic, famous face, and I, I know his movies so well, and so just that was intimidating. And he's very, like, soft-spoken and cool, and, like, you know, and, and that, I, I'm not good with people like that. I'm, I'm very, like, all over the place. So it was intimidating. Yeah. I think what helped Bruce Willis maintain his star status is that people remembered the incredible films that he was in. So, yes, he did have a few Hollywood flops, and so does any actor. It's peaks and troughs, right? But I think people remember, you know, Armageddon. I think people remember Die Hard and remember that he is this incredible action hero and that he can always come back stronger. And he's played so many different roles, been in so many different kinds of films. I mean, The Sixth Sense is completely different from Luke Who's Talking To. Um, and so I think in the years where perhaps he wasn't so popular, where perhaps the box office money wasn't coming in as regularly and as well as it did before, people remember the iconic things that he did. Yeah, the, the one thing with a lot of his, like, latter-day action hero roles is that what what kind of saddens me is it feels a lot of directors misunderstood what was so great about John McClane and about Die Hard and about Bruce Willis as an actor is that he wasn't just the sullen guy with the gun who, you know, drops a line and then goes pew pew and saves the day. There's so much humanity to him and I love in Die Hard when he's on the phone when he's trying to pass the message on to his wife of saying, I've told you I love you so many times, uh, but I haven't told you I'm sorry. And that's the sort of thing that was so often missing from all of these like more recent Bruce Willis action guy roles. But thanks, all, thanks you guys for coming out and uh, making this a really fun thing. And thank you all very much, really. I'm very excited uh, to finally have a star on Hollywood Boulevard out here. Thank you so very much. And obviously now that he has been diagnosed with dementia, I think we really look back at his career fondly. And I think, you know, his legacy will certainly be being this incredible action hero, but being someone who overcame a stutter, who started out on stage, you know, and who kind of has done a bit of comedy as well. He is an all-rounder, but he's truly an action hero. You know, every year is good for me. I don't ever have a low, a low point. I, it's just like, I, I, I wake up laughing, you know, I don't... Uh... Nothing bad, good. It's good to hear it. Yeah. Good work. Thank I you really very much. Really enjoyed the film. Is the camera off?